It's the professional MasterChef quarterfinal. These six talented chefs stood out in their heats. Now, they will face two more challenges to test them even further. My face doesn't probably show it, but kind of poker face. Just try and keep my cool, but really, yeah, panicking inside. Feeling really excited, really motivated, and, uh, you know, ready to go. It's given me that little bit of confidence to say, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. First, they'll have to devise a dish from scratch centered around one ingredient. A real triumph. I think this is fantastic. Those who can deliver to the brief will go through and cook for some of the country's most discerning food critics. This is an ambitious, intelligent, beautifully put together dish. Only the best will earn a place in the knockouts. We want to see something special. We want to see the fight. We want to see our chefs really get creative. The chefs with the best knowledge and skills will rise to the top today. Chefs, this is your invention test. What we have behind us is a table with some beautiful ingredients. You are going to have to choose wisely to create one outstanding dish. Under that box in front of you is one key ingredient that needs to be the center point of your dish. Reveal your ingredients. Coffee, an ingredient that you're all very familiar with. You may not use it every day in your food, but today you're going to need to. And it has to stand out from all the other ingredients that you put on your plate. Come up and grab your ingredients. Along with their coffee, the chefs can choose additional ingredients from the larder that includes a selection of fish, meat, fruit, vegetables, herbs and spices. Coffee can be used as a rub on meat. You can marinate it. You can use it to infuse desserts and dressings, even as a seasoning. This is an ingredient that is going to test our chefs to the limit. Something I'd normally put in desserts, but I have done it savoury before, so that's, that's the way I'm going to go today. It is a bit nerve-wracking. But I guess it's new challenges, and I'm willing to push and see if it works. Coffee and chocolate go hand in hand, really. Um, who doesn't like a little mocha? Right, chefs, you have 70 minutes for one outstanding plate of food that's going to get you through to cook for our critics. Off you go. Thirty-three-year-old Andrew has been working as a chef in the Royal Navy for 12 years and now caters exclusively for the Admiral. So I've had a lot of practice making things off the cuff. I can't get things delivered because it's within a naval base, so I have to go out and shop for all my produce. And I don't drive, so most of the time I just take my skateboard out. I was really happy to see coffee. First thing that came to my head was game, so I was even more happy when I, when I found some game on the bench. I have cooked venison with coffee before. It is a combination that works. So I've chosen two different types of coffee. I'm going to use the green coffee beans mixed with some pistachio for a crumb. It's going to roll the venison in. And I've also gone with coffee, which I'm going to make a sort of sauce out of that with a bit of chocolate in the sauce as well. And I'm doing a puree of parsnip with a bit of vanilla as well. So you're going to be tasting vanilla, coffee, and chocolate. Fancy. I really like the sound of this coffee crumb with pistachios. It looks really beautiful, and I think it'll bring wonderful colour to this dish. We all know that chocolate works with venison, but I want to taste coffee in Andrew's sauce, so he's got to get the balance of chocolate and coffee just right. Head chef Stu works in an unconventional fine dining restaurant, where the restaurant's ambiance 
comes from a rock music soundtrack. My style of food, I'd say, is quite out there. It's not like any other restaurant, really. That's the whole point. Try and push for things that people aren't doing. Try and be as fresh and as original as possible. When the coffee got revealed, I kind of had a bit of a plan in my head, for something that I, that I remember eating as a kid. And I want to draw on that and kind of show that I've got the ability to produce a dish that's classical, yet I can give it a modern twist. And what is it? It's a tiramisu. A take on a tiramisu, the flavours of tiramisu, or, or an actual tiramisu? A stew tiramisu. So a it's stew gonna, tiramisu. Yeah, yeah. So it's not going to be layered, it's going to be individual elements, plated, but with the taste of a tiramisu. Why has this dish got nostalgia for you? Because this was the first thing that I cooked in um, my cooking class at school. Right, so this is a flavour from school days, your first dish you cooked? Yep. Love that, love that, love that. Listen, like the sound of this dish. Thank you. I love a good tiramisu, but this doesn't sound like your ordinary tiramisu. We've got an orange sponge, chocolate ice cream, white chocolate and coffee mousse, coffee twill and a coffee syrup. There is a lot of work here, and 70 minutes is not a lot of time. Thirty-five-year-old Arbinda is executive chef of a catering company which recently prepared a banquet at Buckingham Palace. So the dish is going to be a pork tenderloin, which is going to serve along with the rainbow carrots, passion puree, which is going to go with the crispy kale. So where is the coffee going in your dish? So coffee, I'm using a, a bit in the passionate puree, and I'm going to use it as a curry, marinade for the pork. Being from South Indian, they use a lot of coffee in their food, a bit of coffee influenced. So it will give you a tinge of spices and with the coffee at the back throat. Abinder is doing a pork dish, and he's using the coffee to add to his curry. But I don't want the spices to overtake the flavour of coffee. Coffee needs to stand out with this dish in some way or another. The balancing of the food is one of my greatest strengths. It's all about giving the different flavours in your mouth, which takes your tongue, you know, up and down. So they're going to feel a good punch. Fingers are crossed. Chef, you've got 30 minutes left. Sam runs his own catering company in Exeter specialising in pastries. I don't think the judges have got a full idea of what I'm capable of. I've not done any pastry work yet, which is definitely my strength. Hopefully I'll be able to show that and showcase what I can do. Hopefully I'll get the opportunity to go further. It'd be brilliant to get further. You look quite happy with this challenge. Yeah, I was, I was really happy when the, when the coffee was revealed. It's hugely diverse, but it's also something I'm, I'm quite comfortable with. I've used quite a lot. So I'm making dessert. So I'm, I'm making a milk chocolate mousse with a coffee and cardamom caramel, coffee sponge, and coffee cardamom caramel. What concerns you about this? Timings, everything setting, being the right consistency in the time limit here. Yeah. I think you've got a point to prove here in the dessert department. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Hopefully I can. Let's go for it, Sam. There is a, quite a few techniques here. Chocolate mousse, which needs to set. There's also a, a coffee and cardamom cremo. Again, something else that needs to set. A sponge to make, a twill, and a coffee caramel. But coffee is widely used in desserts, and I think it very much is going to work in Sam's favour. Sussex-based Ben traded in life as a builder three years ago to become a chef. The competition means the world to me. I've put everything into it. Everything else has kind of taken a back burner. Stag do's and all that. But just fully concentrated on this. So to go out now, I'd be yeah, not very happy. So I'm doing a celeriac fondant in butter, thyme, garlic and coffee. Pickled mushrooms in coffee pickling liquor. Crispy chorizo, roasted hazelnuts, and then I'm doing an aerated mushroom and coffee sauce. 
with a touch of chilli for it. It sounds a very interesting dish. I have to say, Ben, you were almost doing a vegetarian dish until the treats of sausage came into the equation. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to check to see how spicy the chorizo sausage was, yeah, really. Yeah. I didn't want to overpower the dish and take away from the coffee. The Solaric fondant cooked in coffee is sort of the key point of this dish. So this fondant is going to be something quite spectacular. My number one concern is the chorizo sausage overtaking all the other flavours. The flavour of the coffee bean has to come out. 21-year-old Sue Chef Curtis has spent most of his professional career in Michelin kitchens. I'm a chef who does like thinking on my feet because from a young age I've had to do this because with my mum being a single parent, she works all day and I had to cook for her and most of the times we didn't have food in the fridge so I just make dishes from anything, you know, and uh, shock her and surprise her. So while your mum was at work, you were delving into the fridge and messing it all up and trying to cook something from it? I, def I definitely was, <laughs> yeah. Was it always successful? Uh, some things were successful, some things not. <laughs> so, Curtis, you're doing a meat dish. What is it? It's a uh, berica pork, brined in a uh, coffee with a coffee sauce and cook the veg in a uh, coffee. Cooking veg in coffee? Yeah. It's the first, but there's always the first for everything. <laughs> you nervous? Yes, I, I definitely am. So are we. <laughs> <laughs> Iberica pork, which has been cured in mushroom duck cell, which has been fried in coffee salt, beetroot mushrooms and carrots, which he's blanched in a coffee emulsion. We've also got a pork and coffee sauce. It's great that Curtis is using coffee all the way through his dish, but I've got a funny feeling that he's just experimenting with us. I hope I'm wrong and I hope that Curtis gets it just right. Chefs, you have just 15 minutes left. Time is nearly up. Last touches, come on. Looking plates of food kicking about. Nice. First up is Andrew, who coated his venison in a pistachio and coffee crumb and served it with roasted potatoes, sorted wild mushrooms, glazed baby carrots, parsnip and vanilla puree, and a chocolate coffee sauce. I like the little coffee and the pistachio around the venison. Little roast potatoes, carrots are beautifully cooked. The dish has got a lovely balance to it. There is coffee running through it in a very delicate way. So I think you've really used the ingredient incredibly well. I also like the fact that you've kept some of the garnish neutral because I find it would be too much coffee otherwise. It's there in the sauce and in the venison, you don't want any more. I think in terms of the brief here, Andrew, you got it absolutely right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really happy, yeah. Uh, oh, it's very validating. Yes. <laughs> Stew's tiramisu is a coffee and white chocolate mousse with orange sponge, mascarpone, orange segments, coffee syrup, and coffee tweel, served with a chocolate ice cream. I've gone around this dish and searched for the coffee. And for a minute, I thought I wasn't going to find it. Now I've just finished eating it, and I can now taste the beautiful flavour of coffee on my palate. I like the texture of the mousse. The orange sponge is nice. But I really think that there's a great opportunity to pack coffee into the chocolate ice cream. Because I just thought that would have just really accomplished the task. I agree that the, the ice cream is possibly where you could have really put the oomph through this and nailed it with the coffee flavour, because it's so subtle. The cremo for me could be 
a bit more rich as well. But with the flavors on this plate, they work very well. The orange chocolate with the hints of coffee, nice. I'm feeling happy. I mean, it, it went to plan. There's a couple of things that I would change in reflection, but I feel like I've done myself proud. Our Binder's dish is coffee roasted pork loin, served with coffee parsnip puree, carrots, shallots, kale, mushrooms, and a coffee curry sauce. The pork is beautifully cooked. Parsnip puree is beautiful and smooth, and the coffee doesn't sit at the front, it sits in the background, and it just makes the parsnip taste even better. The curry sauce has got some heat to it, and the coffee does sit gently in the background, but only just. It does bring this dish together, I have to say. It really does. I've never had a curry quite like it with the hints of coffee, yet this is a sweetness. It's, it's delicious, and, you know, the vegetable garnish, they're so well cooked, and the crispy kale brings a bit more to this plate, and it works so well together in harmony. A real triumph. I think this is fantastic. I'm really pleased for myself, but still, still waiting for their uh, final judgment, which is really important. Uh. Sam's dessert is a milk chocolate mousse and salted caramel coffee cremeau, served with coffee cardamom caramel sauce, chocolate and hazelnut sponge, and a coffee tweel. The milk chocolate mousse is very sweet for me, personally, and possibly too much of it that it starts to cancel out the amount of coffee that's on the plate. But when you do get, you know, the caramel, the salt, and then the hints of the coffee with some of that sponge, it works very well. But overall, when it comes down to the brief, you've captured it very, very well. You've got the coffee running through the cremo, you've got it in the twill, you've got it in your syrup, and I've got the lingering flavour of chocolate and coffee on my palate, which is absolutely delightful. Sam, you had a point to prove. You're a pastry chef that, that knows his craft, and you've shown that. Thank you. I don't want to get too excited about it because I don't want to... I don't want to jump the gun. I think I've done enough. Ben's celeriac fondant is infused with coffee and served with chorizo crumb, carrot, beetroot and dill, coffee pickled mushrooms, hazelnuts, blackberries, and a coffee mushroom and chili aerated sauce. That's the fondant. You've got the hints of coffee running through this espuma, and it's tasting really lovely, and then there's, there's a bit of sharpness through it. I really like it. And then there's this uh, heat <laughs> going through it, which was really nice through the dish, but now that's all I've got <laughs> is, is a strong heat sitting in my mouth. I've lost the coffee. I really like the idea of celeriac and the chavito crumb going through it, and together they're flavours that work, but I'm disappointed that the fondant, you know, um, is not cooked. The acidity of the pickled mushrooms and the coffee, you've got that nice. It works lovely. And the idea of the coffee in the mushroom sauce, great idea. Just not quite hitting the mark, unfortunately, because of the chilies killed the dish. It's frustrating because I know exactly what it could have been. And it, it was just off the mark a little bit. And, you know, these, these things happen. Last up is Curtis, with his coffee brine de barico pork, served with coffee poached beetroot, carrots and leeks, with a creamy coffee sauce. The pork is nice and pink, um, and you've brined it with coffee, and it's very subtle. You can taste it, and I like that it's not overpowering the, the actual pork here. The vegetables are cooked nicely. You've cooked them in coffee. Again, though, it's very subtle. Curtis, I would have preferred you to be a little bit more braver with this challenge and really push the coffee flavour through this dish a lot more. You've cooked everything beautifully well. 
but it lacks coffee flavour. Honestly, I don't think I did show my best today because I think I could have pushed myself a bit more and gone a bit further and a bit more riskier, but I guess we'll see. Did good job today, our chefs. I was pleasantly surprised. A couple of issues here and there, but overall, I thought they used the ingredient to the best of their ability. The subtle hint of coffee in Abinda's cookery today was sublime. For me, the star of the dish was that curry sauce with the coffee sitting behind it. Great dish from Andrew. Wow, did he push that coffee flavour into that sauce. I liked that the rest of the garnish was very neutral because I thought it would be too much. Sam used coffee all over this dish and he had a lot of work to do, a huge amount of skill. The cremeux with the cardamom and the coffee was delicious. We have Andrew and Arbinda and Sam going straight through. Ben made us the celeriac fondants. I really like the flavours of the coffee and the mushrooms, but a sweetness in it and the warmth of the chilli. But then after a while, all you got was, was a hot chilli in your mouth and you could not taste anything that was on the plate. I thought Curtis's dish was executed nicely from a cookery point of view. I just don't think that he used the coffee element of the idea enough. A real shame. And surprisingly, they were all cooked with coffee. Mm. I like Stu's dish. I like the interpretation of the tiramisu, his way. However, they should have packed more coffee into their ice cream to really finish this dessert off. We need to pick the strongest chefs who can cope with cooking for our critics. Who are we taking through? Of course I want to stay in the competition. I want to try and push as far as I can and make everyone proud. I could get thrown a technical fault, but... I doubt it. Very much doubt it. I honestly really want to stay in a competition. It might look like I'm nervous now, but honestly, I, d I do want to stay. It means a lot to me. We have made our decision. And the first chef leaving the competition is... Ben. The second chef leaving the competition is... Curtis. Thank you. It's disappointing. I do feel like I could have given a lot more, but I guess I just messed up and uh, it's a shame because I had a lot more to show. I feel like I had a hell of a lot more to give. I think that's the thing that's disappointing more than anything, but at the end of the day, it's life, isn't it? If you think that's tough, it's the critics next, and they are tough customers. Chefs, this is a fantastic opportunity for you to showcase your style of cooking for some of the best critics in the country. Grace Dent, Tom Parker Bowles, and Jay Rayner. At the end of today, one of you is going to be leaving the competition. The remaining three will be joining our final 12. Two courses, eight plates of food, one hour and 15 minutes. Let's cook. In the Navy, it's, it's not a normal thing for a restaurant critic to taste your food. But used to cooking for important people and VIPs and foreign ministers, cooked for royalty, so it's not unusual for me to be under this kind of pressure. For the starter, 
I'm doing a langoustine tail, marinated in langoustine oil, which I've made myself, with compressed apple that's compressed with dill and apple juice. That's going to be served with fennel puree and uh, langoustine fichi. This is a dish I've been working on for a really long time. It's gone through lots of different changes over the years, and the way it is now, I think, is the best it could possibly be. I'm really happy with it. The main course is duck and cherries, so I'm doing a duck breast with some potatoes cooked in duck fat. I'm making a duck sausage. There's going to be a cherry sauce and buttered broad beans. The first time I practiced, it took me over two hours. <laughs> I've made some changes since then, and I've, I've, I have got it down just on the wire in time, so... Just in an hour and 15 minutes. Just on. So you've shaved 45 minutes off this menu? I have, yeah. The way I'm attacking it, I'm just organising it, getting, making sure things are going on at the right time, and just moving as fast as I possibly can, yeah. Righty. Two varieties of longestines there working together. Sounds delicious the blow torching on the long steam, but it needs to be just beautifully coloured, gently touched with those flames. Langoustine ceviche with chilli, coriander, lime juice and zest. The ceviche needs to be marinated just a few minutes before plating. If you marinate this too quick, the citrus juices will start to gently cook the langoustine. Andrew's main course is to take on a classic duck and cherry sauce duck fat potatoes, the beetroot, the cherries with pickling going on there, and that lovely, beautiful sounding duck sauce. This dish sounds great. The spiced duck sausage, which he's making here in this very kitchen, <laughs> I think will bring something really special to his dish. He is going 100 miles an hour, and he is very focused. I'm really happy with my performance. I really hope that I will carry forward a good uh, feedback all the time, but you're just waiting for one mistake you do and all of your hopes and your expectations is going to go down the drain. Main course, I'm giving a pan-seared sea trout with a coconut and ginger sauce, and it's going with a aubergine and black squidding puree, purple potato and charred cauliflower. The second dish, I'm doing a green cardamom chocolate ganache, caramelized uh, white chocolate uh, soil, and I'm doing a passion fruit sorbet and a passion fruit gel with it. Cooking for the critics today is very similar to, to running a, a service. Yeah. Are you still hands-on with running a service with your team? Really, I'm, I'm really much hands-on. Uh, I'm handling uh, two restaurants and, uh, you know, big event and catering companies. So I'm, I'm really in that zone. So hopefully I'll remain in the zone today. You do not want that sea trout overcooked. A little bit of crispiness on the top, but beautiful and pink in the centre. Coconut and ginger sauce. I expect fireworks from a binder. Aubergine puree. I've never had it with squid ink in it before. I'm interested to see what that's going to look like on the plate when it's sitting next to saffron fennel and purple potatoes. This sounds like it's going to be a colourful plate of food, but if anyone can carry it off, a binder can. Our binder's dessert is a cardamom and chocolate ganache. The ganache is going to be set properly. It's going to have a lovely texture, not too cold, otherwise it will become too solid. You've got a passion fruit gel. Got white chocolate soil. There's some interesting textures and combinations going on here. The one thing you've got to make sure is that all the elements work together in harmony on the plate. Chefs, you've got 30 minutes left. How are you doing, Stu? Yeah, I'm feeling good. What are you doing? So I'm doing cod with andouille, mussels, smoked tomato beurre blanc, tomatoes dressed in a tomato ponzi, and then a dessert of caramelised phyllo, white chocolate and miso creme, and a blood orange sorbet and blood orange segments. And it sounds like you've got a lot to do. Yeah, I've got a lot to do, but I think if you don't push yourself, you can't prove that you deserve a place in the next round. Who's supporting you through this, Stu? It's my little boy, Jack. How old's Jack? Jack's coming up too. So every time I kind of get a little bit stressed, I remember that at some point he's going to watch this and he's going to laugh at me. So I try not to do anything too stupid. I've always struggled throughout my life with confidence in social situations. And this is the ultimate kind of goal, is to show Jack that no matter what kind of pressure you're under, you can always be yourself. 
cod, with flavours of induya or salami, uh, the things that work very well. Also with tomatoes. Stuart knows that they work and they're flavours that we will recognise, but it's all down to the execution. Making sure every element is done to perfection. I love the sound of this dish. I hope Stuart does it credit. I'm not normally a white chocolate fan, but in a cremo, the addition of miso sounds delicious. And of course, pair that up with blood oranges. Sounds great to me. Chefs, you have just 15 minutes left. Coming from a family of farmers, it's given me a huge respect for all ingredients, understanding that actually fresh is best. When I was a kid growing up, we always used to have little lambs in a cardboard box in the house with us. My grandmother kept ducklings in a woolly hat in the airing cupboard. It's a massive link between farming and cooking, and you've got to understand it and you've got to respect it. My grandfather's business, he did fruit and veg. Yeah? Yeah. I was really close to my grandfather, and doing the fruit and veg was, was well, his childhood memories. What are you doing? A roasted duck breast with red cabbage, apple puree, uh, an apple and sage parmana, and a five spice sauce, five spice puree as well. And what's your dessert? Mocha panna cotta with confit orange puree, caramelised hazelnuts, caramelised white chocolate, and a sea buckthorn sorbet, and a chocolate soil. My goodness, Sam, you're not holding back, are you? Maybe I've set myself a, a bit of a challenge with so much to do, but hopefully I can pull it all off. Love the spices he's using with the duck breast. We know five spice works so well with duck. And there's also a lot of spices going through the braised red cabbage. Sam's going to make sure that duck breast is, is cooked beautifully. Nice and pink and rested as well. It's very important. Sam has got long slices of potato, long slices of apple, one on top of each other. He's then rolled it up. He's going to cook in the pan crispy on one side, and then he's going to cook them in the oven so that they cook all the way through. Apple and potato working together. Interesting. Not had that before in a pomana. Sam's dessert is a mocha panna cotta, and he's serving it with confit orange puree, a sea buckthorn sorbet. Sea buckthorn is a sour bitter berries, quite an unusual flavour, and it needs to be used on the right dish at the right time. But Sam is a pastry chef, so I really believe that he would have worked with all these ingredients before, and I'm sure that he's tried and tested this dish. I'm a great fan of ambition. You've got to have ambition to be a great chef, but too much ambition. Don't try and be too clever. Again, it gets back to what it tastes like and what it looks like, but taste is all important. Look, I'm greedy, and I really want to be fed by people who know what they're doing. And hopefully, there are a few of those out there. You know, there's something about seeing us three gargoyles all in a row that actually just melts chefs. They go to pieces. So, yes, you know, what I look for when I come in is, is someone that can just keep their nerve. Cheers, guys. Andrew, we've got seven minutes left. How are we doing? We're going to be all right? So I'm pretty much right on time. Having bought several ex-boyfriends torches over the years, I've eaten some horrible torched food. Be kind to the langoustine, and the langoustine will be kind to you. I take ceviche very seriously, and what would worry me hugely is if they put it in the citrus juice for too long and it just becomes overwhelmingly citrus. Right, Andrew, you got a couple of minutes left. We're looking good. I'm happy with how everything looks, yeah. Looking good. Here we go. Lovely.
So your starter is a torched langoustine tail that's dressed in langoustine oil, some fennel puree, some apple that's compressed in dill and apple juice, and a langoustine ceviche. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is tiny. Look at me and look at it. <laughs> it's absolutely tiny. That said, it smells nice. Yeah, it does. Lovely flavours. That langoustine was very sensitively cooked. I'll almost go so far as to say lovingly and tasted intensely of itself. That ceviche reminds me of what ceviche is about. The purity of the ingredient with a little bit of citrus, a little bit of spice in there, the compressed apple, the fennel. This is a complete dish. For me, it really works well. My only complaint, and I mean this genuinely, is I wish that there was more of it. <laughs> you know, that is a great complaint. I really mean that. Yeah, wonderful. The blowtorch langoustine is delicious. The light charred flavour running through it and then more of that beautiful langoustine flavour from the addition of the oil. The ceviche is delicate, it's light. You can just taste a touch of lime. It's not over marinated. Yes, it is delicate, but it is incredibly small. So Andrew's main, this is a novel but it can be broken down into duck with cherries. He's got to have rendered the fat while keeping it nice and rosy and pink inside. Duck sausage sounds absolutely amazing. Potatoes cooked in duck fat. When do we ever get a potato at this table? <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Cherry jus, it's got to be sour. If it's too sweet, the whole thing's too overwhelming, but it has potential. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you've got four minutes. Thank you, chef. Everything's cooked in time. That was pretty much the fastest I've ever worked. So everything is ready? Everything's ready. And we're on time? We're on time. Nice. So you can enjoy this part? I can enjoy this part, yeah. Are you happy with that cookery? Yes, I'm really happy with the duck. That is bang on for me. You done? I'm done, Chef, yes. Let's go. So for your main course, we've got a duck breast with a spiced duck sausage, roasted golden beetroots, some potatoes cooked in duck fat, buttered broad beans, and a cherry sauce. I am frustrated by this because I can see that all of this makes sense. I love the fact that the beetroots have been cooked to this dark caramelized chewiness, it's brilliant, but the duck which is the key thing, it's overcooked, and the sauce, it's overreduced and it's over sticky. I love the sauce. Mm. I quite like the I, I love the sauce. What he's made, which makes my heart sing, is actual northern Sunday dinner gravy. <laughs> and it is absolutely delicious. The duck sausage is beautifully seasoned. That potato is absolutely something else. Just absolutely delicious. A beautifully fatty dish, but those cherries just come in cut us way through it. It's perhaps not the highest of art, but damn, it's good. Mm. Broad beans are beautifully cooked. The beetroot is delicious, but I think the duck is slightly overcooked. The sauce, it's overworked. I don't like the sauce at all. The sausage uh, has a lot of flavour. It's probably got the most interest, but I find it's a bit on, on the dry side. Real shame. Hmm. Oh, I honestly feel like I can't move. I put so much energy into getting that done. It was hard. <laughs> it was so hard. Yeah. Abinda? Yeah. Yeah, 15 minutes before your first course is meant to be served. How are you looking? I think I should be on time. Okay. The heart of the dish is a piece of trout, and he's going to pan fry it. And he has to get that right. Skin down, make sure it's crisp, don't overdo the flesh. It should come up nice and pink and flaky, just like me. Coconut and ginger, well, hey, some spice, that's always exciting. That I don't know why you would mix that with fennel. It feels like our binder has a lot of ideas and he's going to put them all into the same dish, whether it kills him or not.
How's that looking? Yeah, it's looking fine, perfectly done. Right, let's go. So it's a pan-seared sea trout with a roasted aubergine and black squidding puree, caramelized cauliflower. Fennel is just cooked in a saffron broth, the chicken stock, and it's served with a coconut and ginger sauce here. Thank you. It's colors. It's so beautiful. The fish was perfect, and it so often isn't on this competition just because they're under so much stress. I loved the fennel. I like the fact it was al dente. It's caramelized. There is saffron there. And I absolutely loved the cauliflower. That sauce, give us more sauce. Coconut and ginger and, you know, lots and lots of that, because that, for me, is a star. I actually think the aubergine and squid ink sauce is really kind of deep and funky and quite full on. I could do with a little bit more of that. There is lots of really good stuff potentially happening. You just need to turn the volume up a bit. The trout is cooked nicely in the skin, beautiful and crisp. I really like the pepper potatoes with the curry leaf. I was hoping for a little bit more spice running through this dish. It's just a very, very light curry sauce. I was expecting a much bigger flavour, or even more of it. How was that? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> 15 minutes? Good luck. Cardamom and chocolate, fantastic combination. Passion fruit again works, but it's slightly like I've been, just been through the greatest hits of the last five years and decided to put them all together on one plate. It's just a lot of different techniques that he knows in one long sentence. Then again, chocolate, passion fruit, they do go together. He gets it right, it could be a joyous bowl full of loveliness. Right, Abinda, let's get your sorbet on and get going. How's it look? Yeah, this looks nice. Right, Abinda, off you go. Very colourful. It is, it is. For the dessert, you've got a green cardamom flavoured chocolate ganache. We've got a crystallized white chocolate soil, passion fruit uh, sorbet, passion fruit gel, and I've just got some chocolate rocks on it. And it's garnished with the apple blossom and the honey crisps. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. The cardamom has not been overplayed in the ganache, or to put it another way, you can barely taste it. The chocolate rocks aren't rocky. They look a little bit flaky and rock-like, but they're actually just quite soft. There's not a lot of flavour there. I wouldn't say that that was soil. It's a, a flaky, gritty substance. The sorbet is fantastic. It has the right sharpness and acidity. It's a really fine sorbet. But it is a triumph of, of, of technique um, over taste. If you like chocolate, it works. The passion fruit sorbet is a refreshing addition to the dish. It's not groundbreaking, it's not unusual, but it's been well made. But what I'm missing is Abinda's personality. It was going to shine through in this dish in the addition of the cardamom. I can't find it. So I'm a bit disappointed. I have really cooked my heart out today. Not everyone gets a chance to cook for them, so I'm giving my best shot. How are we looking, Stu? Yep. I've just got one more job to do, Chef, and then I'm going to start plating. OK. I love cod, and I love when somebody that really knows what they're doing cooks it for me. Pork scratching it can go wrong in so many ways. It's meant to be crisp, and it should not have any hairs on it. Mm. <laughs> I don't mind a hair of his. Any hairy oh. bar snacks? No. Oh, no. There's texture, there's a little hint of Japan in there with the ponzu. It's a really exciting looking dish, and I think if he pulls this off, it could be something quite spectacular. Right, come on, Stu, you've got a minute left, let's go. 
we, we really need to get a move on that, Stu. Ready to go? Yeah, Chef. So you have a dish of cured cod that's been pan fried with crispy mussels, endoya, some tomatoes dressed in a tomato ponzu, some lovage cress, pork scratchings, and a smoked tomato beurre blanc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The cod it just sort of lightly falls apart into those mother of pearl flakes. The sauce underneath is glorious, and the texture of the crispy mussels with the little bits of puffy pork skin. Not really pork scratching, it's more the chicharrones things. Really good. You know, the kind of the white, beautifully cooked flesh of the fish. But what is actually made is a really perfect, smoky, fiery, sausagey paste, which is just great. That smoked tomato beurre blanc is something absolutely astoundingly good. This is an ambitious, intelligent, beautifully put together dish. The flavours are big and bold, but never brassy. It's a really great dish. I love it. I find the cod has been over-salted. It's too salty, but I really like the flavours of the enduia with the tomatoes. It's a match made in heaven. You've got smoked tomato beurre blanc, which is also delicious. But you lose the beurre blanc once the endure has taken over the base of the dish, which is such a shame. Right, Stu, you've got a couple of minutes left. Yes, yeah, Chef. How long is it going to take you to finish this dish? Uh, a couple of minutes. So we're good, then? Yes, yeah, Chef. Caramelised phyllo pastry. Miso and white chocolate. Always delicious. Adding miso to anything in a pudding is a winner for me. So we're building a little mill for you, then? Yes, yeah, Chef. Yeah. And sorbet. That blood orange sorbet ought to make me frown slightly with a bit of acidity and sweetness. Well, you're going to have to be quick there, Stu. Right, Stu, off you go. Thank you. So this is a caramelised phyllo with a yoghurt and miso cremu. Blood orange gel, orange segments, marigold, and a blood orange sorbet. Thank you. I loved the phyllo. It was caramelised beautifully, and it was soft, and it was sweet, and uh, it had just the right amount of give on it. It wasn't dry. The yogurt with the depth of the miso, I think yeah, that yeah. that's the greatest thing about this. And you didn't taste the miso. The miso added that lovely umami depth, which actually rounded the whole dish out. It, it, it was a understated, but, but a very clever and a very lively and sprightly pudding. That blood orange sorbet is brilliant. A two-litre pot of that, a box set, and I'm there on my sofa in my underpants with the curtains closed, and really, I could eat an awful lot of that, ideally by myself. I thought the white chocolate crema would be a little bit on the sweet side, but the miso really does bring it down. It complements each other, and the blood orange brings another element to this dish. It's a nice, light dessert. I quite like it. That was excruciating. <laughs> Win or lose, I give it the best effort I could on the day. That's the thing. Sam, you've got ten minutes for your first course. Is it cooked right? No, it's overcooked. The skin's over. Not, it's over. The skin's not crispy. I'm not happy with it at all. Roasted duck breast with braised red cabbage and apple puree. I'm sure that you could probably buy this in an instant ready meal in a supermarket. Actually, my late mother could have cooked this, and in fact, I think she did. When she did it, I really liked it. Potatoes cooked in lots of butter. We can all get behind that. But please, make them crisp and caramelised and bad for you. Come on, Sam. You got this. Yep. Keep your head up, all right? Yep.
Today I've prepared a, a roasted duck breast with a braised red cabbage, an apple and sage parmana, an apple and five spice puree, and then a five spice duck shoe. Thank you. The meat is overcooked, it's tough. The sauce is toothachingly sweet. The red cabbage is toothachingly sweet. The white puree is sweeter than most of the desserts we've already had. <laughs> it's so sugary. It's, it, it, it is like eating a delicious duck pudding. The potato ribbon, I like the idea of apple and potato, but it doesn't even seem cooked, the potato. Yeah, what do you say? It was a bad day at the office. Unfortunately, everything on this plate is far too sweet. The cabbage is too sweet, the sauce is too sweet, the duck is overcooked. This dish had great potential. <sighs> I'm really disappointed here for Sam. Come on, Sam. <sighs> Sam, you've got 15 minutes to finish your dessert. Yep. All right, this should be your strength, OK? So make it the best panna cotta you've served so far, OK? What do you... We get so many panna cottas. It's chocolate soil. Stop it. Caramelised white chocolate. The, he's going to have to have done all of this brilliantly <laughs> for me not to be banging my head on the table. Sam, how are we looking? Everything's ready. Excellent. You're looking a lot happier now. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling a lot better, actually. What interests me here is the sea book thorn sorbet, because I do believe that all sorbets should be a little bit painful. <laughs> <laughs> it should be delicious, but also slightly punishing. I've made a mocha panna cotta with a sea buckthorn sorbet, comfrey orange puree, chocolate soil, caramelised white chocolate rocks, and caramelised hazelnuts. Thank you. Thank you. Sea buckthorn is a very tart, acrid, sharp flavour, and that is a very, very intense mm. sorbet, perhaps too intense. I don't think I can eat a whole plate of it, I'll be honest. The thing is, panna cotta is day one of catering college, mm -hmm. and the one really clever thing you have to do with it is turn it out on the plate. If you just set it in a bowl so it doesn't move, you've only done half the job. Whether that's a panna cotta or not is uh, dubious. However, I think that there's a real mocha taste coming through. There's crunchiness, the sweetness, the sourness. I actually think this is probably the best pudding that we've had today. Sam's panna cotta has a beautiful texture to it and the coffee flavour is just right. It works so well with the comfy orange puree he has. Sea buckthorn sorbet, it's unusual flavour, but it does work. This dish is delicious, I do like it. That is up there with, with the hardest things I've done, yeah. So many things. I wanted to do better and, oh, just trying to do too much, probably. Trying to do too much. <sighs> well, that was an eventful day. But I believe our critics did eat well. They were pretty happy overall. There was no standout chef who got it right on both courses, but the dish of the day for me was Andrew's langoustine dish, the ceviche in the apple and also the torched langoustine. That was by far my favourite dish today. I just wanted more of it. I agree. It was a good dish from Andrew. His main course was the opposite. This dish had huge potential. It just lacked refinement. The cooking was a bit over for my liking and that sauce, which had just boiled and boiled away, was like a really thick gravy without any real flavour to it. Our critics liked Abinda's dish. Abinda's fish was beautifully cooked. It was nice and moist, crispy on the outside, moist in the centre. I liked what Abinda did. I just wish that curry sauce had a bit more punch to it. The dessert worked well. Passion fruit and chocolate is a match that goes well. I thought the ganache was beautifully made and I loved that passion fruit sorbet with the sharpness that cut through the sweetness. The cardamom for me didn't quite sing out as much as I, as I, as I wished it would. The critics really enjoyed Stu's main course, 
I thought the fish personally was too salty, but I really liked the flavors of the andouille with the tomatoes. They worked so well with that beurre blanc. I liked the white chocolate and miso cremo. I thought it had a really good neutral flavor. It wasn't too sweet and it complemented the blood orange aspect of this dish. Sam, unfortunately, really overcooked that duck breast. Not only that, it was very sweet. Our critics were disappointed with it. We were disappointed with it. But I thought Sam pulled it back with his dessert. The panna cotta had a great flavour of coffee and it had beautiful smooth texture to it. It was lovely and light. It worked well with the sharpness of the seed buckthorn sorbet and this comfy orange puree. This is a competition that tests our chefs at every single level. We've got to take the strongest three through. I think we both agree on who the three chefs should be. We know how much this means to you. This is what we do for a living. And I know every one of you wants to be a part of our final 12. We have made our decision. The chef that is leaving us is... Sam. Thank you, Sam. Uh, devastated. I'm happy to have got to this stage, but it's just one deal further. Kicking myself for ages because I should have done it better. This is unreal. <laughs> it was hard work, but it's paid off, so I feel really good. <laughs> I feel great. It's really one of the craziest things I think I've ever done in my career so far. I'm oh, really, really happy. Yeah, final 12 is amazing. I did not see that coming in the slightest. I'm buzzing there. I'm going to have to push myself to the limit in the next round and just smash it, basically. <laughs> next time, six more professionals compete for a place in the quarter final. My head's going. You have three minutes, chef. It's a delight, and you haven't done the norm. You've done something a little different. Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed it. <laughs>